So we'll make a start. Welcome to the Strategic Planning Committee here at County Hall, Council Chamber on Tuesday the 5th of July. Um, as I normally do, I would just like to quickly run through um, the procedure when we deal with the planning application. As chair, um, I introduce the application. Um, having seen the uh, site visit videos, which again have been circulated to members. I then ask the planning officer to present his report, um, giving us any updates, any changes to recommendations. We then have a public speaking slot, five minutes for an objector, five minutes for a local member, parish councillor, county councillor, and then five minutes for an applicant or supporter of the application. Members of the committee are then invited to ask questions to the planning officer, and then we um, debate the application before us, um, asking for a proposal, a seconder, and then the debate takes place. We then take a vote. Um, and the chair has a casting vote if um, the vote by member, members is tied. Any apologies for absence today? Yes, Chair, I've received apologies from councillors Dodd and Foster. And councillor Ball. And councillor Guy Renner thompson Have any members of the committee got any interest they wish to declare in any applications? Uh, I'm the ward of the resolution on 286 on the agenda. Uh, as I emailed yesterday, uh, thank you for allowing us to be brought before the committee today. I'm actually surprised it's here rather than at the local LAX. Um, thank you for turning on the microphone. Uh, I've got no conflict, but I would just like to mention I have spoken to many residents in relation to this also to the applicant and the planning department as well. Uh, but I intend to continue as part of this meeting throughout. So you're just declaring a personal interest, really? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, you've got a just, declaration of interest. Yes, I have. Thank you, Chair. It's just to say I am a Blythe Town Councillor, but I've taken no part in the debate or the um, the comment that's been made by Blythe Town Council. So, it's, yeah, I will be taking part in this. So then we come to our first application on the agenda this afternoon, item number five. This is a full planning application for the construction of a new special educational needs school with associated access, car parking, landscaping, a mugger, a multi-use games area, and outdoor playground space. And this is on the site of the former Princess Louise Adult Learning Centre, Princess Louise Road, Blythe, in Northumberland. So I would like to ask our planning officer, David Love, to take us through this application. David, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is a, an application 220702FUL uh, for, for a new SEND school. It's a special education needs school. Uh, there's access, there's parking, access, landscaping, multi-use games area, outdoor playground. It's on the site of the former adult learning centre on Princess Louise Road. Uh, before I start the presentation, members should be in receipt of an updated conditions list issued last week. Uh, this was a result of ongoing discussions between the applicant, the planning authority and internal consultees. The conditions are essentially the same as those issued in the original report. They've just been updated to reflect some information that came in from the applicant from the publication of the re original report to um, last Thursday morning. Uh, so, 
There we are. Yeah. So the, the application site is indicated by the purple hatched area. That's the site boundary. Uh, just to provide some bearings, the Blythe Sports Centre is up to the north of the site. Uh, yeah, you can see my pointer. Um, up to here, this is the new Blythe Sports Centre. Um, and this is the line of the Princess Louise Road, moving on to Newsham Road. And this is the primary school. I've got two different labels in this mapping system, so I don't know if it's St Andrew's Roman Catholic or if it's St Wilfred's Roman Catholic. I suppose the important thing is it's, it's the primary school. And this is the open space area with the, I believe that's associated with the primary school. So the northern section, that is, that's proposed for the parking area and it utilises an existing access into Blythe Sports Centre. It's worth noting that this area previously received consent as part of the Blythe Sports Centre development uh, for the same purpose and that remains extent, extant. The southern parcel is the former adult learning centre and that's indicated by the, the rough general rough square shape with the dog leg and that's that's the predominant area of the former adult learning centre and the area south of that is the is an area of open space so just um northumberland local plan extract it's simply to demonstrate that the there are no designations or allocations affected by this proposal Although it's not pulled through to the map, and my apologies, this area down here to the east of Newsham Road, it follows this vacant area, that is an area of protected open space. Um, number five, uh, some aerial imagery. I've lifted this from Google, so apology for the, the labelling. Uh, I find that Google tends to be the most up-to-date aerial image. Uh, so you can see the extent of the green space here at the back of Newsham Road and the car parking area would be up here and just to again sports centre clearly labelled primary school just to give some bearings uh, this is the main portion of the site it's currently vacant you'll have seen the site videos previously it's uh, previously developed land uh, the area surrounding it is residential So on to the site plan. So the blue area indicates the extent of NCC ownership. So we, we do have an interest in the site. And you can see the northern portion here coming off Princess Louise Road, existing access, that serves the Blythe Sports Centre. And the southern area here, this is the proposed site plan. So you can see the footprint of the new school and the multi-use games area on the southern portion and the extent of landscaping. There is a, a formal landscaping plan later in the presentation. So I'll dive on to some elevations. So I'm just going to run through a series of elevations. So you can see it's a largely a rectangular shaped building. Uh, this is informed by the shape of the site, existing mature vegetation, which we want to see retained, and availability of the landform. Uh, so north and east elevations, and really it's, it's a, it is what it is, it's a, it's a modern building, a modern school building, and south and west elevations, same sort of, uh, same, same flavour. I've included the floor plans just really for completeness more than anything else, first floor, uh, ground floor and now the first floor. So this is the landscaping plan. You can see from the extent of, the, the, of this plan that the applicant intends to, to green the site. Quite a lot of boundary treatment work. Uh, a lot of those are actually retained mature features. Uh, it represents opportunities for wildlife, especially considering the current state of the site, which is considered previously developed land. The multi-use games area to the south uh, here, the mugger, short for. Uh, members may be aware uh, we have received some some commentary from third part from a third party with respect to uh, potential noise impacts. Just to clarify, there are no uh, floodlights, and there 
we, there are mitigation measures for noise as agreed with our public protection team. So just some photographs. This is the, the parking area, the northern portion. Uh, so that's on the left of the image here. That's the extent of the Blythe Sports Centre parking and the parking area would literally just, just attach onto the end of that here. This is the front of the site. Uh, you can see it's pretty green, well greened up. You can see the traffic lights at the far end of the picture. There is a, that's a pedestrian crossing and we've got some traffic calming measures on the road already. So this is within the site itself. Again, you can see um, extensive area of, um, hard, of concrete hard standing across the site and quite a lot of mature vegetation. I, I don't know how long it's been vacant for but the uh, vegetation on the site would indicate some time. Now, this is the area to the south. This is the open space area. I've got a couple of images of that. So you can see they are, it's, not, it's got quite a long sword on it. The grass is quite long. What we have is some desire lines cut through, uh, just to allow walking throughout. Now, the, the policy does protect these areas of open space, but equally, if you are seeking to improve them, to keep them for... Um, amenity space, then the policy would, does support their, their development. Uh, so you can see in the background there the sort of houses, typical houses for the area. Um, generally, I believe, ex-council stock housing there. It is quite close to the games area, which is why there's no floodlighting and we've got mitigation measures for noise and we've got restrictions on use. Um, so just to close up on that, the proposal represents an appropriate form of development that would not have a significant adverse impact on the street scene or the amenity of nearby residents or on existing users of the site or on uh, yeah, nearby residents. It offers a positive addition to the education function of Northumberland County Council and is supported by the Education Department. The concerns raised in the letter of objection have been considered and it's been addressed accordingly, uh, likewise with commentary received from Blythe Town Council. That has been considered by the Council's Highways Department. And the proposal is considered in accordance with national and local planning policies and officers recommend it for approval subject to the conditions listed in the papers, on the recycled paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Um, we only have one public speaker this afternoon, and that is Jen Patterson, who will speak for no more than five minutes in support of the application. Over to you, Jen. Thank you, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the joint applicants, Bomer and Kirkland, and the Department for Education. Um, I won't keep you for five minutes. Um, as outlined within the case officer's report and in his presentation, the proposed school complies with planning policy at a national and local level. The development will deliver 80 school places for pupils aged 11 to 16 with autism and or social, emotional and mental health needs. The need for these school places for pupils with special educational needs has been established and the development is strongly supported by Northumberland County Council's education team. As you will have seen from the presentation, the site is split into two land parcels. The site containing the school was previously occupied by an educational use and historic foundations, hard standing and service, services remain on the site. The school will have a multi-use games area to the rear together with outdoor learning and play space and alongside integrated soft landscaping. The delivery of sports and recreation facilities in association with the school <laughs> Accords with adopted policy as the existing open space would be replaced by an area of better quality open space for use by future pupils and the mugger will also be made available for community use. The new school building will be set back from the Princess Louise Road frontage with a dedicated drop-off and pick-up area to the front um, as needed by a special educational needs school. Secure cycle parking facilities for staff and pupils are also proposed. The car park will be located on the north side of Princess Louise Road, next to the Blythe Sports Centre car park, and will provide 40 spaces, which, is to, which are to be used only by school staff. 
The principle of educational use on the site is established by the former educational use and the local policy support for the creation of school facilities on available land and in suitable locations to meet the needs, to meet local needs, in accordance with adopted plan, development plan policies. So, to conclude, the proposed school is policy compliant and will contribute significantly to the Council's established need for special educational need pupil places in the county. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, um, this is your opportunity to ask our planning officers any questions you might have. Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I noticed the entrance and exit. Town Council have, are a bit worried about that. Um, why have they got the entrance on the east side and the exit on the west? Why not have them the other way around? Then the entrance would be nearer the corner and not exiting onto a corner, or not on the corner, but close to it. Uh, thank you. So, um, I, I don't know the design, um, I don't know the design process that's informed that element of it. Uh, what I can say is that there was, there's quite a robust amount of work has gone into <clears throat> into that element on, in terms of the application. Um, so page 15 of the papers, Highways Impact, there's been a transport assessment, a framework travel plan uh, being prepared by a company called Hexa Consulting. And they have, they've prepared these documents in terms of safe road safety, highway safety. That's been assessed by Highways Development Management team for our own highways engineers, and they've come back in terms of road safety, they're satisfied with those implications, uh, with that. If our highways guys are coming back to us saying, this is fine, there's no, there's no um, reason, in terms of planning reasons, to change it, or in terms of the Highways Act, then our ability to influence a, a change in those arrangements is, is um, pretty negligible, to be honest. But there's also, in terms of um, highway safety, there's also a condition which requires a travel plan, and that is condition number. Sorry, bear with me. Yeah, seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah. Oh, sorry, seventeen. Seventeen in the report, members. It'll be a revised number on the conditions that went to you this week. But yes, essentially that's a, a full school travel plan. So within, so that's going to require monitoring work. I mean, bear in mind also the um, it was a school previously. I mean, you know better than I um, uh, that it was a school previously. So you know this does represent an improve. My understanding is it represents an improvement on that former extant position. So I, I, although I can't give you a definitive answer about the design that led to that, I hope the amount of work that's gone into it does allay any concerns. Thanks for that. I, I still can't understand. I know there's no such thing as common sense in planning, but I can't understand why they didn't have the entrance and exit on the other side. It's, it just seems the normal, or not the normal, but the sensible thing to do. Um, I'm just shocked at it, but it is what it is. Yes. Well, unfortunately, Councillor Hutchinson, you know, we're not privy to why that was decided, but obviously the the assessment on the current arrangements has been very rigorous and our transport team are happy. Um, so we've just got to um, deal with what's there. Second question from Councillor Georgina Hill. Thank you. The questions I've got around the mugger um, there's a scheme that I funded, part funded anyway, in my area, and the mugger is very, very popular, but it does cause a lot of nuisance to the small number of, of residents, and it's the ball smacking against the, the wire. I do think that there probably is a solution to that sort of thing. Um, and I know there's talk of mitigation and acoustic fences, but is there any examples of 
provisions that put in to, to mitigate the, that noise. And it is, it's not so much kids running around, it really is that the ball smacking against the fence. So I'd be interested to know more on the technical, what's been put in to stop that. I don't have the exact mitigation measures to hand, but I do recall reading in the noise mitigation plan, which forms part of, in your papers will be condition 11, um, there is reference to the fence type for absorbing noise and preventing noise, etc., etc., you know, these kinds of things. So that has been considered, and we can only operate within the confines of... Um, I'm loath to use the word nuisance because that has connotations in terms of um, the environmental uh, environment, the public protection team. But essentially, it has been considered, and it was something which our environmental, our public protection team, sorry, did spend a lot of time working with the applicants on in terms of making sure the noise impact. I appreciate what you're saying in terms of ball hitting a fence, um, but and the, the the rattling noise that that might make. But ultimately, very limited impact because we'll have, like I say, this fence type, which hopefully is going to limit noise anyway. And you know, there are no floodlights associated with this. So there's only going to be limited use during the day. So I hope that sort of helps to explain where we came from with that. If I could, Chair, it was just to say that if it is the case, and I don't know, I'm not an expert on these things, but if it is a case that there is a option, it costs more money. And it is really, it's that repetitive on, you know, the fence that, you know, is, is quite a lot for the, for the neighbours to bear. So if it is the case that there is a, a solution which costs a bit of money, I would strongly suggest that that's been made to, to, to be done, because otherwise there's going to be a huge amount of complaints. landscaping plans and the um, proposed fencing and you'll see around the site there's different fencing in different areas of the site and I think they probably have already thought about the most appropriate type of fencing there beside the mugger it's certainly different to what's proposed on the right hand side of the site close to the residential properties but we will bear that in mind as we deal with the discharge of condition 11. Thank you. Councillor Watts. Thanks, Chair. And um, with regards to the car park opposite, um, the sports centre does get busy at times, and we do have St Wilfred School, which does have problems with parking. So, do we know how the car parking is going to be managed in terms of preventing other people from using that car park? So, the the it's anticipated that's the area for staff, and then pupils will be. We'll have the, the um, drop-off pick-up point within the actual site. It's within the southern portion of the site by taxi, minibus, you know, whatever means it is. Um, I'm not aware that there's any formal control measures for the, for the car park area. Um, and I think there is a condition covering... Sorry, bear with me. Fifteen's EV parking. Well, it's it's EV and um, details of the car parking area, including the revised EV bays and accessible bays. So we're going to get a further plan. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, so condition fifteen is would allow us to assess that uh, in further detail, and that's details of car parking area, including revised EV bays, so electric vehicle bays and accessible bays. Uh, so we, we have a, an, a further opportunity to assess that. So if, that's, if that is a particular concern, noted in the minutes, we can have that conversation with the applicant at the appropriate time. Councillor Darwin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question you may, not, may or may not be able to answer this, say, uh, the panel as well. The school is a special education needs and disability school. I've just been looking at the plans, and uh, on the first floor plan, the ground plan, I see one lift 
Forest School that is predominantly at risk uh, children with physical and mental needs. There's going to be a large quantity of children upstairs on this first floor level. Has there been a vertical emergency evacuation plan done in this building? And if so, is that adequate? I, I work in the field and for the amount of people that we want on this first floor level, having one lift is not adequate. Have we, looked, have we taken that into an assessment? That is not a humane way of getting people with a disability down a set of stairs. And I, I don't think that if that assessment has been done, I'd like to know the outcome of that assessment. As I say, it may not be one that the panel can answer, but I would like to know if the vertical assessment has been done. Thank you. That is a good question. And um, in the documents that have been submitted by the applicant, they have set out um, their emergency evacuation processes. So I can read the little extract that's within their, their statement, which says that the building is designed with appropriate emergency refuges within staircases to allow for managed and assisted evacuation. All refuge areas will feature an alert and <coughs> intercom link. The school will develop a personal emergency evacuation plan for any student or member of staff with mobility and or cognitive impairments, and the procedures should be practiced during the fire drill. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. I did think that might be the case, actually, and that, that it's, it's not a very humane way of um, allowing people with disabilities to evacuate a school. This has been done quite extensively in the grounds of the built environment, and Having one evacuation lift is, is, leaves people there exposed to it. If there was a fire, they're left exposed in that school. So I understand there's a peep for people of that nature to evacuate, but it, it's, not very well, it's not very widely practiced anymore. And normally we have to have a, um, a lift for each, for at least 10 people upstairs, if they are to evacuate from that building. So I would like to ask the applicant to reconsider the amount of lifts and diverse routes out of that building as well. It's um, predominantly been left out of buildings and this, I think this is a, a prime example of where that, this can be redesigned to better suit the needs for this school. Thank you. Can we take that back to the applicant? Yeah, no problem. Any more questions? Martin? Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a couple of questions about the, uh, the green space, which obviously is going to be, obviously it's uh, available to local people at the moment and it's going to be, it's going to be lost to them. Um, so firstly, is there any biodiversity offsetting to be done with regard to that green space? Um, that obviously won't necessarily help the local people, but it will, it, it would mitigate against, part, partially against the loss of green space. But the other thing is, um, with regard to the use of the facilities out of school hours, um, I see there's reference in the report to community use agreement. Um, I think probably in relation to the mugger mostly. Um, but how strong is that? I can't see it in the conditions. Maybe I've missed it. Um, we have a, a school in Annick which has a, a community use agreement, but actually we have no community access at the moment. Now we're trying to work on that, but um, it, it's, it certainly seems to be the case. It comes down to the, um, the people who are running these, uh, these, these buildings to, to actually make that happen, and it's obviously quite important. And if we're losing the green space, then it would be important to be able to, the community to gain from being able to use the mugger. So thank you for that. So in terms of the green space being used, I assume you're referring to the protected open space area in the southern portion, which is what the mug is going on. So, well, in fact, to answer your first query, which was about biodiversity offsetting, so uh, previously developed land, so it's brownfield site, and what we're getting is an enhancement in terms of, we've got bat and bird boxes being installed in the building. Um, we've got the green, we've got mature vegetation and landscaping, etc. So, being assessed by the ecologist, so yes, there's, there's a gain there in terms of biodiversity on the site. In terms of the second query with the mugger, I haven't included a condition in terms of community use to have a community use plan, etc. in there, simply because it's, it's a building that's going to be, be um, ran by our own education department. So, in my experience, and happy to be corrected here if it's different for NCC, but I've, I've always thought to leave that to the education department. It may become appropriate to have times where it's not available for community use. I don't know why, you know, for any reasons for management and purposes. So I've, I've left it for the education department to set up the community use, to arrange that with... Um, Active Northumberland or whatever our partners are and who run that side of things. 
uh, as opposed to planning. So I don't think it needs to be a planning condition. I think it's adequately covered under uh, auspices of education and other council departments. Councillor Jeffreed. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> um, good report, by the way. Every time I had a question, you answered it in the next paragraph, so well done. Um, but it's 17, it's, sorry, it's 7.17 about the adequate cycling parking provision. And I just wondered what you consider to be adequate in this case. So in terms of the adequate parking, um, sorry, was your question, was it adequate cycle parking in particular? Yeah, so <laughs> good question. Um, I have to admit, I don't know what adequate cycle parking looks like in this situation. Uh, I don't know how many staff members would typically cycle to a school like this. Um, so what we did, we included it in a, one of the planning conditions which will allow um, our colleagues in highways development management to give us a bit more specific um, comment on that element. So there's a requirement there in one of the conditions for the applicant to give us full details of cycle parking. So, sorry to say I can't answer the question today, but it is covered by a condition to be addressed at a later date. Um. That was kind of the point of asking the question because I didn't think you would know and I think the reason it's got adequate in there is because nobody knows. I mean, you know, there will not be many local pupils. Most people, most of the, the pupils will come from afar, I guess. They'll all come in, you know, motorised transport of one way or another. Um, and I I'd, I'd, was kind of just trying to get the... People are trying to cover all bases, but actually it might not be appropriate to have that provision at all. And that's kind of what I was trying to get at. And I, I, I wouldn't be afraid not to have it, just for the sake of, you know, oh, let's put three or four up because we think that's what should be right. But if it's not appropriate, then we shouldn't do it. If I may, Chair. Uh, no, absolutely. Conditions for the sake of them. I shouldn't be using them. Uh, you know, planning conditions we attach, we always consider, uh, first of all, is it necessary, the, the six tests of planning conditions. Uh, in this instance, we are required through NPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework, to consider alternative use and modes of transport. Now, you're absolutely right. The expectation is that the pupils are coming in, the motorised vehicles. But I don't know about teachers. Um, support staff, etc., uh, and it's to give them an, an opportunity. And depending on how the car park is managed, um, you know, it could be opportunities for other people to be able to use it as well. But yeah, I absolutely get your point. We shouldn't be attaching conditions unnecessary, but in this instance, um, alternative sustainable modes of transport, I think, is something we should have in. Could I ask for a recommendation? Councillor Watson. I probably should have said at the start, this is in my ward. Um, so I would like to recommend this tenant application as per the report and the set out conditions. Um, there's a clear need in Northumberland for this type of school. Um, and I just think it's a real benefit to the, the area that it is in Blythe, because I think it's 2016, David, when it was last used as a site. Um, and it has become a bit of an eyesore now. So I think to have a school back on that site that has a lot of um, memories for a lot of people when it was Princess Louise Road is a real positive for the area. Um, there is an area to be lost at the back that is part of the country walk, but I think, again, that that's a positive because it is a big open area, and so I would like to see the community get benefit of the mugger that's been mentioned as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It is the amended conditions. With the amended, yes. yes. With the amended conditions. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Councillor Reid. Moved by 
Councillor Watson, seconded by Councillor Reid. Um, anyone like to speak to the application? Councillor Jeff Reid. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to welcome welcome it. I, you know, it's it's going to be a really good facility. The, the, count, the county need it. It seems to me to be a well-designed thing, but we need to bear in mind what's been said about the about the lift and all that, but I'm sure you're going to sort all that out. Um, so let's just get on with it. I am a bit concerned about the the parking arrangement and whether we can have staggered starts and you know staggered arrivals and departures and that car park. You're going to need to watch because if you don't have any kind of barrier on it, and basically all the school's doing is taking something that was passed two or three years ago to just give the car park more capacity. So you're going to need to just kind of work on that a bit, but I'm glad to see we're leaving the, the, the electric charging points in there because that was something we asked for when it was going to be part of the, the, the sports centre car park. So you're just going to need to... The traffic is going to be the thing that catches us on this. So we just need to be aware that we might have to put a barrier on the car park. We might have to manage that somehow. And we just need to maybe think, or the school needs to maybe think about how people arrive and when they're going to leave and staggered times of starts and finishes. But it's really a great scheme and I wish it all the luck in the world. Anyone else, ladies and gentlemen? Councillor Hill. Thank you, Chair. Just to echo that, I think it's a really good scheme and it's just um, unfortunate sometimes when you have good schemes and you can get 98% of it right, but the car parking is not right or the disability or the muggers causing neighbours a headache with the noise. So just um, to echo, it's a really good scheme, I support it, um, but just tight uh, adherence and uh, enforcement of, of the conditions. So everyone can enjoy it without any complaints. Just from the chairman, um, you know, yes, this is a real good news um, story from our education department, um, investing in a school specifically aimed at helping those with special educational needs. Um, but I take on board the points raised this afternoon, and that's what good planning is all about, is trying to anticipate any problems, any snags the scheme might have. So hopefully our planning officer, David, is going to take these away this afternoon and work on them. But thank you very much for raising them. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, that has been... I don't know if our proposer wants a final word or you're quite happy. Um, it's been moved and seconded that we approve this application. All those in favour? Unanimous. Unanimous. That's carried. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, we move on to our second application this afternoon, and this is for um, its housing site on the former Prudder Hospital, Prudder Hospital Drive, Prudder, and its variation of condition one on the approved application 20 oblique 00571 oblique verico in order to move uh, to sorry in in order to move plot numbers 208 to 222 um, from the western location on the master plan to the central location occupied by plot numbers 363 to 393 and to alter the house type mix and move plot numbers 363 to 
393 um, 31 affordable units from a central location on the master plan to the western location occupied by plot numbers 208 to 222. David is going to speak to this application. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully, um, through the course of the presentation, it becomes, a bit, it becomes quite clear, but it's quite a convoluted description. Uh, before I commence, I must advise members to some minor changes required to the report. Uh, paragraph 1.1 is missing some text. Uh, it should read, the, uh, this application is to be determined at Strategic Planning Committee, given that it relates to development that is of strategic importance. And paragraph 8.1 should read, the proposal represents an appropriate form of development that would not have a significant adverse impact on the street scene, ecology, or the amenity of nearby residents or existing users of the site. Um, objections have been, uh, those objections that are material have been addressed, and the proposal is in accordance with national and local planning policies, and is therefore recommended for approval. Um, so moving on, the site has quite an extensive history. Um, I think the, the report was some 70 pages, but actually I think about 60 of those was just the site history. So the, sorry, just get my notes correct. So the location of the site, uh, you can see by the purple hatched area. Yeah. Uh, the south site is southeast of Prado, immediately adjacent to the settlement with access along a, through a long driveway from the main road. Um, this represents the full extent of the site, which covers some 400 units. NLP extract, this is the extract from the local plan. The site does fall under an area of open space, but the consent that's been granted, it's extant. Um, so members will note from the extensive site history in the report. Aerial imagery, and, and again, I, I, as I say, I, I tend to lift these from Google because they usually are the most up-to-date in terms of aerial, aerial imagery. So you can see the, the nature of the site. Um, it's partially built out housing estate. It's extensive. It's a large site. Um, you'll note the extent of the woodland along the eastern boundary along here. And you'll note the completed units. I think there's some 132 units have been completed already. Uh, this represents phase part of phase one and part of phase two. Uh, what the proposal seeks to do is swap out the area that was approved in this area, this site here, and move it into this bit here, basically just swapping those two areas over. The type and tenure of the affordable units isn't changing, um, and nor are the overall housing numbers. Master plan, it's, I've included this as for completeness sake as opposed to anything else because it's, it's nigh on impossible to read unless you have it on a note. Uh, but does extend, it does demonstrate the full extent of the overall works. Uh, and like I say, it is a site of some 400 units. So that's the area here um, of the current units of private housing swapped over with this area here which is where the affordable currently is, and they're just swapping them over. So this is the arrangement to the private development. You can see the 15 plots, 15 units in here. It's of akin with the rest of the site. You know, it, it is what it is, ultimately. At the end of the day, it's, it's in a housing estate. And this is the arrangement for the affordable units. Um, tenure's not changing, so we have a number of discount market value um, social rented units in there as well. Our colleagues in the housing enabling team have commented they were involved with discussions, I believe, prior to the application coming in, and they're quite content with the proposals. Uh, so, essentially, this is just a, a good... This is the easiest way, I think, to understand it, to be honest. So, the two areas marked with the red star, they're just swapping over. And so this, the areas in red show the consented areas of affordable housing at the moment within the site. You can see it's within the middle of the site, essentially. 
and this is what it's moving to. So it'll be these red areas are the affordable units. Now, ideally, you would have these sort of pepper potted throughout the development rather than clustered like this. But given the site history and the extent of consent established as pattern of development, um, officers are quite content with the proposals. Uh, the development's also moving the affordable housing units over to this side here. They are, they're backing onto the woodland. It's, I would have said personally it was a better, better site overall. So I've got some elevation plans to give members a flavour of the, the type of housing. But you'll have seen from the videos the type and mix of housing that's generally there. These, um, these units aren't changing the, the flavour. Uh, materials are proposed for a slate finish and uh, a slate and brick finish. So just run through some of these elevations. You can see that much of a muchness with what's already on the site and then some of the larger units. So on some um, photographs, um, you'll have seen the videos previously, so just including photographs just as a refresher. Site's a bit of a mix of completed housing and of uh, and a building site at the moment is being worked out. Uh, you can see there a bit of a flavour, trying to capture the flavour of the, the types of housing throughout, but you're probably familiar with the types of units that are across this sort of estate in Northumberland. At the moment, you see the pallet, materials pallet being slate and a brick finish, the last couple of slides. And moving on just to demonstrate that it is currently partial building site and, and partial housing estate at the moment. Um, yes, sorry, so the recommendation is as per that in the papers. No changes to the conditions on this one, so it's recommended for approval subject to those conditions in your papers. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. There are no public speakers on this application, so it's straight into questions from uh, members of the committee. Any members got questions on this application they'd like to put to the planning officers? Malcolm. Thank you, Chair. Um, David, you said there was no change to the house mix, but that's exactly what it says here and all of the house mix type. Now, I presume they're taking 31 houses out, putting 15 in, and I presume we're talking about four and five bedrooms instead of two and three bedroom, so they can charge more. The accountants have obviously had the slide rules out. Um, so there's no difference in house mix to the affordable and the social rented. Is that what I'm talking Yes, I think that's an excellent point. So yes, the, the 15 units that they're swapping into the central site, yes, that's, as, that's exactly as you say, yes, those are going to be your bigger properties. Um, the affordable units, yes, you're absolutely correct there as well. The, the type, and, type of affordable units isn't changing. It's still going to be the same size of units that's going in there, the same um, social rented, blow market value, it, that, that's the type and tenure of the affordable units are staying the same, but yes, you're right. The private houses are essentially going to be four or five bedroom units. So, no, th thank, thank you for, for clarifying that with me. Any more questions? Councillor Jeff Reed. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> the obvious question is why? <laughs> uh, uh, that was my opening point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was reading over your shoulder. I mean, has there been any explanation of... It's the same, but different. I, I just... I just wonder why. So if you can tell me, that'd be great. But you're going to say you don't know, aren't you? <laughs> I, would, I would be guessing. I would be guessing. I mean, ultimately... Um, I, can, I can guess by simply saying perhaps the central area where the current affordable housing currently is offers them an opportunity to put bigger units in, uh, which ultimately, same number of units, bigger, more value. Um, yeah, someone hit the nail on the head. The, the bean counters have had the abacus out and, and they've, uh, they've probably done the sums. 
Um, but ultimately, yes, it's the same but different, as you say. <laughs> but I, my, my, my stab in the dark would be they can get bigger private units on the site whilst retaining the same numbers and types of affordable units. Um, I would have said personally the area that are moving the affordable units into backs onto woodland. There's been an ecological impact exactly. assessment done on that, exactly. so there's no adverse impact exactly. beyond what's been assessed. I, I personally would prefer to live backing onto woodland. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just me. But yes, I can only guess that it's um, a site they can put bigger private units on. But I'm sorry, I don't have a definitive answer for that one. Mr. Stewart, another question, sir? Why? But it's already been asked. <laughs> the Pritter Hall is a beautiful old building there, and it's situated not too far from where the affordable houses were to be located. And it may be some sort of thing you can't mention today, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Do you know what's happening to the hall and the walled garden, which is a great two listed building there? Could it be the reason that they're moving to another location to increase the prices of the houses down there because of this beautiful old building down there? And it is a wonderful state in a, a fantastic town, we all know that. Um, and it's been well planned out, but it's not that old. So why, what's been the catalyst for the changes here? You've sort of touched upon, there's no evidence of that. It may just be the, the market changes um, come through the pandemic. People want to move more into the countryside now. Is there anything in that? You know, why have they suddenly changed it? And it has made uh, a lot of differences to people's lives in Beechwood uh, and Humble's Wood, which will be backing on to five instead of one house there. Again, there's anything there. You know, the members had the opportunities to look at the, the videos, I uh, had a look at the remarks and the objections by the residents there, but really I just go a little bit further down into why. I think you probably hit the nail on the head with changing market conditions, and the the company are looking to react to that by providing um, bigger private unit, larger private units. As you say, people now from the pandemic work from home is more more accessible to so many more people now. Um, they're perhaps looking to move out of conurbations and into areas which are more rural. Um, and as new is no doubt, it's a beautiful location. It's in Northumberland, of course it is. And I would guess that's what it is. To answer your earlier question, I don't know is the answer, but I can certainly do some digging and find out for you. It probably is that. Um, and I, I don't know whether you'd actually the answer for that. On Martin's comments there about discount market value and social housing, are they exactly the same numbers? You may have a, an aggregate of the two, but are they exactly the same as they were prior to this? Have we increased the number of social housing? And before you touch the microphone, because I'm renowned for talking too much, um, you're saying that all the material objections have been addressed, which is fair enough. The wildlife corridor isn't too far away from there. There's also a very contentious footpath that comes from Park Avenue, leads down to Stanley Burn, which development on previous occasions had closed down for many, many months. And the Secretary of State had a rubber stamp. The authority closed that there. Um, if this does get planning permission today, will that have a, a real detrimental impact upon the wildlife corridor and the footpath from Park Avenue down to Stanley Burn? So to inform this development the applicant had to complete an updated ecological impact assessment because as you say it is moving closer to the wildlife corridor and our ecologists were our ecologists were fine with what came out of that and there's sorry i'm skipping through all the history um and so the suite of conditions, yes, yeah, sorry, they, they were happy with it as long as the conditions previously attached were carried forward into this one. So that's what we've done. So the numbers of units are all the same. Number of bedrooms are all the same. So it's 31 affordable units. That's, what was, that's what's consented. That's what's being moved. And we're having the same number of units. So there's no increase in units. Bedroom numbers are staying the same as well. And then the, the tenure mix is staying the same. So it's the same numbers in terms of uh, uh, below market value and social rented. So these things, they're all staying the same. The conditions, we're carrying the conditions forward that were previously attached. So there's no 
further impact on the wildlife corridor. So all the conditions attached previously are carried forward. And the same with the footpath. There'll be no um, further impact on the footpath, as you've described, with, um, if members were to grant this permission today, subject to those conditions. Councillor Alec Wallace. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, I think members are all of the equal mind that the developer, it's quite obvious what the intentions is, and it's in the right if they want to make more money. I'm looking back at the almost 60 pages, and I, I hope I've got it right, that planning permission was put in place here quite some time ago. So my question is, they know how much money they're going to make, have we looked at the change in viability and the Section 106 commitment that can give more community gain to the public with the changes to additional four and five bedroom homes that would bring more wealth to the developer? This is something I feel very keen on and something that gets lost. Now, I know the developer will say, I've had to draw up more plans because there's a change. We didn't ask for the change, he's asked for the change. I'm asking for more than loose change in this instance and to give more to the people of Prudder. Thank you. Uh, no, we haven't looked at the, we haven't revisited the viability of the scheme to reinform the Section 106. Ultimately, in planning terms, principle of the development's been established, Section 106 has been signed, this is the same number of units. I appreciate what you're saying, and I'm a big advocate of the same thing myself. In planning terms, I'm sorry to say our, our hands are tied, we can't revisit that, but I do, do appreciate what you're saying. Councillor Georgina Hill. Thank you. Uh, quick question first. It's not, I know it's not material, but who is the developer? Jen. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Gentoo? Jen. Gentoo Jen. Homes? Ah. Okay. Um, just on this issue of, because it doesn't sit easily, the affordable house has been sort of shunted off into into the corner, the sort of segregation. Um, what would happen? Well, well there's two questions. I mean, first of all, can you talk around? Is there any planning grounds for objecting on that basis of the you know, shunting them in the corner? And if, for example, um, another change of condition came in and they said, oh, look, there's bats in the woodland or whatever, um, we can't actually develop those now, what can we... What we I'm very cynical, aren't I? The rumours that they're putting the bats in there now are... Um, what what could we do in that in that scenario if there's another change and then suddenly the affordable housing is off us off the table? Because I'm quite cynical, but I suspect there may be more twists and turns in there. Uh, essentially, I think in this instance, I, the modern national design code would advocate an approach of pepper potting, um, if you like affordable housing throughout the development. It helps to create communities. Uh, the original approval predates that. I, I can't remember the exact date of the National Design Code, but this has sort of evolved, if you like, uh, this scheme. Um, I, think, I think the schemes have failed. I think in terms of the location of the affordable housing blocks, um, I don't think it's that bad, personally. I, I, you know, it's moving off to the side, but I was saying earlier, that's it. It's backing onto a rather nice area of woodland. You know, we've, 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 we've surmised in, uh, about why the, re the removal of, of plots, etc. In terms of the delivering of the affordable housing, they, they can't. They can't not deliver it. It has to be done. It's part of the phasing plan. Um, I can't em envisage a situation where we as planners would ever say, oh, yes, that's fine, carry on. I suddenly wouldn't want to see the affordable housing bumped all together in one area, I think this is probably the, um, the extent that we would want to see the affordable housing altered. What you wouldn't want is to take, um, sorry, my, my screen's not showing there, but essentially if we consider it as being four blocks of affordable housing, what we wouldn't want is for all of them to be shunted over to one side together. That's definitely something we wouldn't support. 
It's not in the design code. It's not a good practice. It's something as planners we wouldn't support anyway. But they have to deliver the affordable housing as a phasing plan, and they have to deliver it as a phasing plan. They can't just skip it and say, ah, we haven't made enough money. We need to go and do something else before we deliver it. They can't do that. It has to be delivered as per the phasing plan, which, unfortunately, I don't have a copy with me, but ultimately, they can't not provide the affordable housing. Any more questions? Councillor Hutchinson. I've got a couple, Chairman, actually. One is just for well, peace of mind. I haven't seen such a, a large history of planning applications before. Did you realise that quite a few are duplicated? I didn't. I'm afraid I took one look at it and lost the book. So, 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 so did I. I must be sad to look and say, oh, I've seen that before. The other one goes back to uh, Councillor Wallace's um, 106 agreements. Can we now, since this is a new application, can we now look at a new 106? Um, that's a really good question, and I've just been sat here mulling it over myself. Um, the, it may be that the original 106 agreement um, has got a clause in it which allows for it to continue to apply in any subsequent variation application coming forward. I was just having a look through the notes there to see when that was, because it's more recent times that we do that. So um, what I was going to suggest is that we... Um, I'm trying to think about how we deal with the recommendation or whether you give authority to the director in conjunction with the chair. It gives us a chance to check the 106 and make sure that all those 106 commitments carry through to this consent or we revisit it and, and bring it back. Um, I'm also interested in revisiting the clauses in the 106 just to take up Councillor Wallace's points about the viability and whether there were any viability triggers in that as you know when these really certainly we do this a lot more now on large developments coming forward we know that it takes many years for build out and during that time market conditions change so like this it's entirely acceptable for an applicant to come in and seek to revise their house types um, etc but what we need to make sure is that if there was a clawback or any viability clause that we're meeting that as well I suspect it's an old consent and there isn't that in the 106, but we will check it, so that would be what I would recommend. Um, if I can just add to that, I've just had a quick look on the um, Council's planning portal, and if we're talking about um, the reference 14041604, which is development for 392 dwellings, which I think is a substantive... Yeah. Um, there is what's called a Section 73 clause in there, which means that um, the Section 106 applies to any variation applications, so it should apply to this. If you're talking about wanting to revisit viability, I'm not sure how you're going to do that in a, a proposal. Um, I would suggest you may have to even defer it for that to be looked at, the decision. Yes, absolutely. If there is a clause that triggers that, we would defer it and we would look at it, but I suspect there won't be that, and you think it is there, Melanie? Sorry, the, the yeah. Section 73 clause is there. Yeah. So this this original Section 106, which was signed in 2016 or something like that, will apply to this mm -hmm. application. If you're wanting to revisit viability mm -hmm. to uh, amend the, the 106, I'm not sure how you're going to do that in a do you want to defer this or do you want I, I think members what I would prefer is that you recommend to give delegated authority to the chair along with the director um, we will check it and make sure do you not want that Melanie do you not think that's to, the right way to check to check what sorry um, I just wanted to double check that there was no no further clauses in the agreement that um, at certain points we would revisit any viability if the applicant had negotiated right. certain have, aspects of the 106 at the time. So I don't know what the ask was at the time, but sometimes they do ask to negotiate it, and we will allow that, but we will also put a clawback clause in. All right, so was viability an issue at the outset? I don't know. Oh, yeah, right. okay. that's what that's I can try and have I a look, know. but if... Yeah, yeah. 
Chairman. Slip Wallace. Yeah, Chair, can, can I suggest we take cognizance of what's being said at the top table? And um, we do give delegated authority to yourself and to the um, um, Rob Murphy. I think we have enough experience amongst ourselves to realise that there probably isn't any viability here. Any developer of salt will uh, tell you that. That uh, there isn't. But what we're sending out is a marker to future applicants of this type that this planning authority are now conversant with the member's wishes that this is checked vigorously and we are mindful that at the end of the day, Chairman, it's for the benefit of our community that we're asking for this to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Martin, have you got a question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, you talked a bit about the, um, the, uh, the private housing that's being moved, but um, with regard to the uh, affordable housing, can you guarantee that the plot sizes are the same as they were previously, and also that the house sizes are the same as they were previously? They are the same as what's been approved previously, so it's the same... Same number of units, same number of bedrooms, um, garden sizes are, are, I believe, they're the, the same. Um, so yes, they, 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 are the, they are the same, although it's going into a, an area of higher density, they are essentially the same. It's essentially the same thing moved across, Martin, so yeah. So just to confirm, the land area of site A and site B is identical. Well, they're making the site area for the affordable larger than what was originally approved. That's why we had to get an updated ecological impact assessment for the wildlife corridor. So that area is being made larger. Oh, there we go. Um, but yes, the, by making that area bigger, they're able to, to maintain garden sizes, building sizes, etc. So yes. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? No more questions? Could I ask for a proposal? Yes, Councillor Darwin. Uh, yeah, Chair, I, I uh, propose this uh, to, go, to be granted. Uh, given the conditions that Melanie and uh, Liz, apologies for names, were, were having before, and that we give you delegated authority to then look at the Section 106 money, because I do agree with Councillor Wallace and I think there's a precedent to be set out there that if they're going to look for more money in the market value we, should, we too should get more money in the market value for the residents of Northumberland so how that's worded I do not know I'll let, I'll let that be worded from yourselves. I'm not quite sure myself. <laughs> well, um... if, if it... My own thoughts are that um, you just vote on the recommendation before you but that we will give a commitment that we won't issue any decision until such times as we have checked the 106. I don't know if it would assist, can, I can tell you what the obligations are in the original. Um, that would, yeah. That just very generally, there's the um, affordable housing provisions, which mm -hmm. I assume won't change at all in respect of ho house prices. Mm -hmm. um, that, that'll be as it is. There's um, an Eastwood Park playing pitch contrib contribution uh, an off-site recreational contribution and a blade and roundabout improvement contribution. Um, I mean, a lot of these, I think, are within certain, some are within, some are prior to commencement of development, which has already happened. Um, some are within three months, four months, five months, six months of commencement of development. Again, from what you're saying, I assume that's already happened. Um, and the blade and roundabout contribution seems to be after seems to be thirty no later than thirty months after the commencement of development, and that uh, appears to be the extent of the the contributions. Yes, I think the query is more: um, should the developer, as such, be contributing more to the section one hundred and six? as a result of um, a different build-out. 
and um, you know that's what as a planning committee we would like to explore and we're going to explore with Mrs Cinnamon's help and um, your help Melanie. Yeah so just to move this forward Chair what I was going to suggest is that members you go ahead with the recommendation as proposed in the report but we will not issue that decision until we're satisfied that we've reread, reviewed the 106 um, and made sure that it continues to apply to this future decision. Uh, so, or, or do you want it in, in, the, in the resolution to approve the application subject to review of the section 106 by the director of planning mm -hmm. in conjunction with the chair if there are any changes to be made yeah. to bring it back to committee? Yeah, that's the alternative. So we could either do it that way. I mean, either which way, we, we, we most definitely will review that agreement. Uh, I suspect it will be the case that there is nothing more to give on it, but just to, to double check. So, Darwin, it's your call. Uh, yeah, so just to confirm, if, you are, if you're going to look at it and there is something that we can get more from it, it'll come back to the committee. If, there, if you look at it and there's nothing more can be done, it'll just be granted as it, as it is in the recommendations. Yes. I'd be happy with that because I have the confidence in, in yourselves, the officers, to look at this and whether where there are availability for us to get more from it, I'm confident that we can do that. And if there isn't that ability to, on this plan application, we have tried, we've asked the question, and I think as a president going forward, we do want this to go ahead. So yes, I'd be, I'd be happy with that recommendation. Would someone like to second? You would like to second it, Councillor Hutchinson? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're right behind him there. Fine, thank you. Anybody like to speak to the application? Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely disappointed with the developer because uh, there's a lack of consideration and communication with the residents and Humble's Wood in particular. Uh, this has been dragging on for so long. And absolutely right, thank you for raising the, the point about 106. It's something which the residents have raised as well as a query. And at the time planning was granted, there's I'm living a nightmare with lots of planning issues on this estate, Humbleswood and Cottier Grange. We spoke about the, the walled garden, we spoke about access on the roads um, on previous meetings. Uh, we've also discussed street lights weren't put in place. There's a multitude of issues of raised concerns. And um, this play park in one part of the 106 in Humbleswood is causing a lot of concern to residents there. So it's not a straightforward one. And I do have regular contact with Gen 2. Um, I have written to them a while back and at the behest of residents to say, can you withdraw this application because it's causing so much concern. Now, the people aren't snobs. They're, they're not people who feel it's... Uh, they don't want these cheaper houses behind them. It, most people, including myself, came from social housing backgrounds. It's really because they had one house behind them. Now they're going to get five. And... Councillor Hill mentioned there before to be pushed up in the corner. What there is in the corner there is nothing except beautiful woodlands and great views across there. But for people, you're going to get more people living up there because there's going to be more houses. Um, they're going to travel more. And there's no exit at the far end on Moor Road, which is the main road. Along with that, continue because you know, I'm not going to chain myself to railings up there especially if it's winter time, but certainly I really object to Gen 2 or any other developer come forward and one exit route out there. <coughs> so you're going to get more traffic, um, the climate impact is going to be there, but also people at the top end of that estate, they've got to have a car to get anywhere. There's no shops, no facilities anywhere near there. And another one of six, I think, is a, um, a bus service coming in there, but that's many years off. So there is limited footpath access up there for anybody at all. So you've got to come a long way to walk across there. So really, I'm disappointed with Gen 2. Um, I hear what you've said there, and the proposal's been put forward about amending the 106. Uh, and I'd ask Gen 2, who are probably watching this today, who I speak to on a weekly basis, please can you review the 106 if this goes through? Thank you. contributions from the floor. Councillor Malcolm Robinson and then Georgina Hill. Malcolm, you've Thank got the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, I realise questions are over, but uh, 
was all right in here, and this originally went through in 2016 because, uh, you know, we've, we've seen the way house prices have gone. I know um, materials and whatnot recently have, uh, have gone through the roof as well, but house prices are probably nearly double what they were then. Um, so I think it's imperative that we we'll look at the 106 again. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago we were accusing builders of land banking. You know, it looks as if they're all building on the land banks now because of the prices they're achieving. So, and they're not doing it for nothing. So I think there's certainly a case to be made for this 106 to be looked at again. Councillor Georgina Hill. Thank you, Chair. I, I agree with uh, that what has just been said. And I mean, with these developers, as if you, if you said, it's not a dirty word that, you know, they're making profits and employ people and so on. Um, and we need houses. But I do get frustrated when you feel they're taking the mick a bit, to be perfectly honest. And I think, you know, there's so much cynicism around affordable housing. Often it's not affordable, it's just discounted um, and then diluted and shunted off in the corner. I, I mean, I know I'm getting on to national policy, but I would much prefer in such situations like this that they gave money to the council and the council, maybe in partnership with the Housing Association, built more social housing. Um, would be a much better scheme rather than having all this fiddling on which is going on. Um, I'm still chewing over this, but I, uh, I mean, I certainly whatever happens to Section 106, if people are minded. But I'm, I'm, I'm swaying against this application and its whole. Councillor Jeffreed. Oh, I might as well drag this out. Or half past five. Um, so, a lot of us have sat on planning committees for many years and countless times we've had applications to, to change house types, shift stuff about. And I've been advised many times that there isn't anything we can do about it anyway. You know, so if we all sat here this afternoon and said, no, no, we don't like this, we think it's not right, we think those affordable units should be where they were put in the first place, they would appeal and we would lose. So, you know, we've just got to man up. Um, we just need to try and get the best deal we can. But remember that those afford if this the 106 is about affordable units, then those affordable units are just as expensive to build as the ones that are selling privately. So it's costing them more money to build them. You know, it's a rabbit, it's a rabbit warren underneath all of this. You just, it's complicated. And as far as I understand, there are social housing units in amongst that stuff. Some of them are, some of them are going to be so below market value, and some of them are presumably going to be run as rented accommodation by Gentoo, who, who that's what they are. So, you know, that, that's just how it is. It, and from the conversations I've had with social um, housing associations, they actually prefer to have units in clumps rather than pepper-potted about the place because the management of, if they're scattered about, the management of those is far more complicated than if they have, you know, if it's a, if it's a big site in this... 40 affordable units that prefer them in tens, not you know one or two here, because the management of them it just becomes a nightmare. So, you know, I'm glad we've all had our say. I'm glad we're going to have a look at the 106, but you can't not vote for it because we there are absolutely no grounds to re, no planning grounds to re, to refuse. So, let's just hope we get another unanimous vote. Thank you, Chair. You know, just from the Chair, um, I would just like to throw into the pot too, this is a, um, a housing estate that's been built over a lot of years, and as we've seen with other applications, one of the problems when a housing site is built out over several years um, 
the permission is asked by the developer for changes um, and obviously that's what's happened here but you know at the same time you know uh, uh, from the chair uh, I promise you that Rob Murphy and I will um, have a look at the section 106 and see if there's any clawback at all for the benefit of the people of Prudder and Northumberland. Thank you. Just wondering if you would like to conclude, Councillor Darwin, as you move the application. Uh, yes, I would, uh, just very quickly, uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm glad we've all had a bit to say. I think it's all evident that we all want the increased value in the Section 106. Since it was granted many years, 2016, the power prices have risen quite significantly in that as well. Um, but I, I concur with Councillor Reid as well. If we did, if we went against this and it was to, we lost an appeal, we couldn't add this weight onto this application. <laughs> By granting this and adding this weight on, we can hopefully get some more on a six for the residents of Northumberland, and that is the purpose and the benefit of doing this. But with our local plan, we are trying to you know get ahead of the game here a little bit. So I'd just like to start by saying, let's add that weight on that we've that Melanie and Liz have come across to as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, with um, that addition, um, this application has been moved and seconded um, with the request that we have another look at the Section 106 to see if there's any clawback. All those... Chair, sorry. sorry. Shall I just um, read out what... what okay. Um, what you think... What I think the resolution should be from what you've said. Yes. Um, so that would be to approve uh, the application subject to review of the Section 106 agreement by the Director of Planning in conjunction with the Chair. If any amendments are required, uh, the application will be brought back to committee. If no amendments are required, the decision notice will be issued. Thank you. Yep, that sounds good. All those in favour of that recommendation? Any against? Two. That application is carried. There is an appeals update there for members' information, pages 99 to 108. Are members happy to receive that? Um, as chair, I've got no urgent business. Thank you for your deliberations today and your